Welcome to the Rainbow Push Saturday Morning Community Forum. We're excited about this week's forum with so much information and so many great uh, presenters this week. Well, I know many of you wanted to watch the uh, Congressional Black Caucus's tribute to Reverend Jesse Jackson. For whatever reason, you were unable to make it. You couldn't join on Sunday night. Well, guess what? We have a, a surprise for you. We have excerpts of uh, part of the program and uh, Dr. Otis Moss III, Dr. Frederick Douglass Haynes III gave some powerful tributes and messages and so they have agreed to just send their tributes to Reverend Jackson to air on our broadcast this week so you're going to get to hear both of them. You, you don't want to miss this. Also, uh, we're going to let you hear Reverend Jackson talk about uh, his thank you to the Black Caucus of the DNC but also uh, talk about some challenges that we face today and one of them being what's happening with the post office and the postal workers. We're calling for demonstrations all over the country. As a matter of fact, we want to make sure that you call your, your U.S. Senator and your United States Congressperson and urge them to support funding for the post office as well as PPE for every postal worker. We know that you can do this we want you to take this initiative today. And so you'll hear a little bit about what's happening with the postal workers. Also, you'll hear about the census. We're having a major census town hall this coming Tuesday. The census is so important. Everyone needs to be counted because it determines how resources are allocated for public schools, for public health, for all kinds of, uh, you wanna know why your roads don't get repaired, why the bridges are crumbling, it's all about the census dollars and how they are shifted. We're gonna hear about our exciting virtual HBCU tour. Parents, I know you are wondering, I can't send my child away in COVID. You don't have to, they can get on the virtual bus and ride to several HBCUs, historic black colleges. They will stop at various uh, historic sites. It's gonna be a fun thing. You want your child on this year's HBCU tour. And it doesn't cost as much. You know, before we would ask you for $360 for an eight day, seven night trip. Well now, it's simply $35, just a push membership. Put your child on the bus, wherever you are. And we're going to South Africa this year. You don't want to miss this. And then uh, our summer STEM program is still going on. It's not too late. We want your children to learn archeology. span We want them to learn uh, how to design their own games. You don't have to keep going buying something in the store. Teach your child how to be an entrepreneur, how to be creative, how to learn the technology, not just use the technology. But I need you to join PUSH today. It's only $35, $15 if you're a senior or a student. Join right now. You can text the word PUSH to 41444. You don't want to text, go to rainbowpush.org, push donate, or a membership. You can be a member right now. We need your dollars to help feed more families. We're doing COVID testing. We have a thousand churches connected. We're teaching technology to seniors, to churches, and to young people. You got to help us. We need you. Pushing for you is what we do absolutely best. Every summer, Push Excel brings you a state-of-the-art summer program. This year is nothing less. We are doing a virtual STEM program, and this year we will have theater, archaeology, music, arts, basketball, even Zumba. So 
family, friends, everybody sign up, ages seven to 15. Go to www.pushexcel.org for you to sign up for our virtual summer STEM program. As well as at the end of the summer, join us for our virtual college tour. We will have an entire week of activities for our high school students. Jump on the bus, all of our high school students. You will not be disappointed. Jesse, why do you take on these tough issues? They're not very political. We can't win that way. If an issue is morally right, it will eventually be political. Tonight we choose interdependency and our capacity to act and unite for the greater good. The only time that we win is when we come together. You must never stop dreaming. Face reality, yes, but don't stop with the way things are. Dream of things as they ought to be. Use hope and imagination as weapons of survival and progress. America must never surrender to malnutrition. We can feed the hungry and clothe the naked. We must never surrender to illiteracy. Invest in our children. Never surrender and go forward. We must never surrender to inequality. We must never surrender. America will get better and better. Keep hope alive. Reverend Jackson recalibrated the moral compass of the Democratic Party when the party was drifting to the right, attempting to recover from the stinging defeat of Ronald Reagan. He forced this nation, he forced us all, to face our midnight and dare create a dawn for those suffering in the corners of American society. The themes of this message are taken from the themes that Reverend Jackson preached and spoke about in 84 and 88. They speak to the values that we hold sacred, that we must learn how to face our midnight if we are to see a new morning. It's time for a new course, a new coalition, a new leadership. Somebody got to rise above race, rise above sex, a new leadership, a choice, a chance. Don't cry about what you don't have, use what you got. Reagan won the last time, not by genius. Reagan won when we were asleep. He won by the margin of despair. He won by the margin of the fracture of our coalition. He won by the margin of racial division. He won by default. I close with another story. There's a little shepherd boy named David. Everybody in town was scared of Goliath. Philadelphia, your time has come. Don't stop at the mayor's office, go on higher. Because you must never forget that about the time we began to take over cities, Nixon shifted the power to the suburbs. And now Reagan shifted it to the states. So you got males with more and more responsibility and less and less power. Yeah. We've got more and more folk and fewer and fewer services. We cannot stop. We got to rise on higher. Yeah. Little David. Little David. Little David. Took off his unnecessary garments. Little David. Didn't want to get weighted down with a lot of foolishness. Little David took what God gave him, a slingshot and a God biscuit, a rock. Our problem today is, David, we're going to organize Pennsylvania and win because we're going to stop the rocks. It's been laying around and pick them up. In 1980, Reagan won 
Massachusetts by 2,500 votes. There were over 100,000 students unregistered, over 50,000 blacks, over 50,000 Hispanics. He won by 2,500. Ted Kennedy State. Rocks just laying around. He won Illinois by 300,000 votes. 800,000 unregistered blacks, 500,000 Hispanics, rocks, just laying around. He won. In 1980, three million high school students unregistered to vote. Now they've been registered to draft. Rocks, just laying around. 11 million college students who could have chosen jobs over jails and peace over wall that didn't vote. Now they're crying. Rocks, just laying around. Reagan won eight southern states by 182,000 votes. But there were three million unregistered blacks in them same eight states. Rocks. Just laying around. He won New York by 165,000 votes. 600,000 students unregistered. 900,000 blacks. 600,000 Hispanics. Rocks. Just laying around. 1980, Reagan won Pennsylvania by 300,000 votes. 400,000 students unregistered, more than 600,000 blacks unregistered. Reagan won Pennsylvania by the margin of despair, by the margin of the fracture of our coalition. Your time has come. Pick up your slingshot, pick up your rock, declare our time has come. A new day has begun, red, yellow, black and white we're all precious in god's sight our time has come it is midnight it is midnight in america the light of our mythic dawn has been replaced by the darkened sky of america's refusal to face her history and pull back the veil of social dysfunction lurking underneath our democracy it is midnight. Something is wrong in our nation. On paper, our nation is an amalgamation of wealth, creativity, power, and alleged possibility. But this country built on stolen sacred soil of indigenous people is being haunted by chickens coming home to roost. It is midnight. Midnight has come to America in the form of Confederate ghosts masquerading as political pundits who shout peculiar lies wrapped in the cloth of conservative mantras like make America great again. I must stop here parenthetically and raise the question, what year are you talking about? Was it 1861 when I was still considered three fifths of a human being? Or was it 1950 when not everyone in this nation had the right to vote? What year are you talking about? It is midnight in America. One half of this nation is enthralled by this phrase, and the other half shudders in horror at the mere mention of this statement. For fear these men and women are chanting wicked incantations to return America to a romanticized antebellum moment. It is midnight. How can a nation be so divided? It must be midnight. And I must say that we all must be confused by the schizophrenic nature of our nation. Out of a total of 45 attempts, we as a nation had the wisdom one time to elect a person of African descent as commander in chief. And we watched, it seems as if years and years ago, we watched with joy as a family with buckets of swag uh, brought historic dignity to the office while those on the right and left will argue about the impact of his policies, no person with a lick of sense 
can deny the beautiful dignity and epic elegance of a family in America uh, that occupied the White House, that at one point in American history would have been lynched, but now shall be forever engraved in the annals of history as one of the greatest presidential families to ever occupy the White House. Say what you will about President Obama. The truth cannot be denied that there was a dignity, integrity, grace, intellect, and spirituality that filled the halls of America's house in Washington, D.C. Is not God ironic? For God used a family from the south side of Chicago to teach a nation, if grace is a color, it must be black. For no other political family in recent memory has handled ignorance, mean-spirited attacks, bigotry, racist questions of citizenship with such grace and class. Maybe the legacy of the Obama years will not be health care and climate policy, but a national referendum on dignified leadership when dealing with undignified people. Midnight, I say to you, has come to America this day. I see the skies darkening upon the strength of this democracy. It is midnight. It is midnight when the children, children are caged and mothers weep just as Rachel wept in Israel. So does Isabella from Guatemala as she cries for Jose and Selena. It is midnight. This nation of scientific advances, military might, and economic prosperity is the same nation, I say to you this day, the same nation of health care, misery, opioid addiction, mass incarceration, environmental denial, toxic masculinity, structural white supremacy, and federal malfeasance that abandoned a nation during a pandemic. The same nation that prides itself on economic prosperity is the same nation where it's easier to purchase a gun than receive a scholarship. We have greater protections for inanimate objects than children and youth seeking educational opportunity. It must be midnight. It is Dr. King who stated, midnight is the hour when men desperately seek to obey the 11th commandment, thou shall not get caught. According to midnight, the cardinal sin is to be caught and the cardinal virtue is to get by. And it is a moral midnight in this moment. It is a moral midnight when predatory self-interest becomes the primary objective of public office and private enterprise. But I must say to you today that it was a country preacher of humble beginnings from South Carolina who joined a movement to force America's moral clock to move from perpetual 1159 to a new morning. He dared inject in our civic conversation a discussion about poverty, health care, incarceration, affordable education, forgiveness of debts, workforce development during the midnight of the Reagan and Bush years. Let us not forget Reverend Jesse Jackson was a product of the teachings of Dr. King, Ella Baker, Bayard Rustin. As a result, he injected progressive ideals into a party in 1984 and 1988, registering over three million people, changing the trajectory not only of a party, but also of a nation. This midnight, this nation that is struggling with its moral compass. Ah, we see at this moment that our value system is rooted in the fact that we can face our midnight so that we can bring about a new morning. Our value system is drawn from an ancient well that speaks uh, for the least, clothes the naked, houses the homeless, releases the oppressed, and heals the broken. We measure our success in this nation, not by Wall Street, but how many people we lift from Skid Row. The measure of a nation is not your gross domestic product, the GDP, but our commitment to care for those left behind by unfettered markets, greed, and selfish ambition. Our values seek to address the moral midnight of this nation and bring light to the darkest corners of our country. Moral midnight must be fought back by a moral compass. We are in this moment, this midnight moment in America. But there is something that I must tell you on this day. 
There is something about midnight I forgot to tell you. To tell you that midnight is dark, but midnight is also morning. You see, after you move from 1159 uh, to midnight, a new day has already come. Our God is on the move. It may be dark, but morning is coming. And I say to you on this day, on November 3rd, we have the power to move America from midnight to a new morning. On November 3rd, we have the power to shift the moral compass of this nation. And the question is, what does this new morning look like? I'm so glad you asked that question. It is the morning that was dreamed about by King, envisioned by Ella Baker, preached about by Reverend Jackson, written about by Baldwin, presented in song by Aretha. This morning demands we get in good trouble like John Lewis and holy mischief like Pauli Murray. We become unbought and unbossed like Shirley Chisholm. Morning is coming because midnight cannot last forever. See, the bad news is it's midnight. But the good news is it's midnight. You missed it and you missed your shout. The bad news is it's midnight. The good news is it's midnight. Because when it's midnight, it is also saying that it is morning time. Even though it's dark, morning is coming. I know morning is coming. How do I know morning is coming? Because Carlisle was right, no lie can la live forever. I know morning is coming because William Cullen Bryant was right when he said truth crushed to the earth will rise again. Morning is coming because James Russell Lowell is right, truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne, yet the scaffold sways the future. I know morning is coming because the Bible is right, you shall reap what you sow. Morning is coming because our faith in a new day will be able to transform the jangling discords of this nation into a beautiful symphony of humanity with our faith we will be able to speed up the day when all of God's children in this nation black and white Muslim and Methodist Asian and atheist Latino and Lutheran progressive and Pentecostal Protestant and Catholic Jew and Gentile queer and Quaker Sikh and sanctified indigenous and immigrant agnostic and Anglican Baptist Baptist and Buddhist, Hindu and holiness, ghetto and country, redneck and reformed, urban and suburban will be able to join the hands and sing in the words of that poet from South Central LA named Kendrick Lamar. We gon' be all right. Morning is coming on November 3rd. Let us bring a new morning into this nation. It's midnight, but there is a new morning that is coming in America. My heart rejoices. I think about 60 years ago, several classes and I went to jail trying to use the public library. I ain't saying that was, but this fall I met uh, John Lewis and Jane Bevel from the Alpha River from C.T. Vivian, James Lawson, Diane Nash. Young America was on the move and we changed America for the better, I would, I would like to think. I want to thank Mr. Perez and DNC for this tribute tonight. I want to thank uh, Bridge Rollins. Leo LeBron, they put them right off institute. All you mean to me in, in this special. I want to thank my friend, Maxine Waters. We've been together all the way since I'm sure you placed Gus Hawkins and before, really. Uh, when she speaks, Walls, we listen more. We listen when she, when she speaks as well. I want to thank God for Al Shopton. His mother brought him to me. He was 12 years old. Put him on the arms. Well, Al's voice now has a very distinct voice and we need it as never before. Mar Morial, they need to form a grand presidency because they thought we could win uh, Louisiana. They closed down the primary. Mar Morial filed a lawsuit and won, and then we won uh, Louisiana. Dr. Michael Dyson, who was a teacher of Jesse's Union Seminary, she called it the Tula Seminary. Jamal Bryan, the son of a bishop and grandson of a bishop, really. So let me express my thanks, Jonathan, to you and to all those who mean so much to me. I would like to sincerely thank all of the members of the DNC and my father's and my father and mother's friends that have contributed, participated to this truly unique and distinguished honor. It's been three scores to see my father on the battlefield for freedom and justice now for 60 years. And you can't pick your parents, but I tell you, if I had the chance to choose 
I would take my dad. Um, what makes him unique and distinctive in my eyes is he's a long distance runner, a champion of the people. I can tell you one of uh, two stories when we last saw President Nelson Mandela and he was up in age and ankles were swollen and wasn't receiving many visitors. And when he heard that my father was in the country, he summoned us to come over there and he stood up with the strength he had left in his body. And I could hear his voice now. He said, freedom fighter. And it sent a chill down my back. And the first thing that came to mind was it takes one to know one. And so he's a part of that legendary group of freedom fighters that's recognized by all those persons around the world that have sought freedom. And I remember in 1984 when free South Africa was a bad word. And my father took that language to the Democratic Convention. And I remember shortly thereafter, we went to jail in D.C. And I'm saying I'm proud to be the son of Reverend Jesse Jackson and having gone to jail with him for free South Africa. That's when I said, this is an incredible man. And for all the sacrifices he's made to make America better, to bring a generation of people into the Democratic Party. And the party is better, as we've witnessed with the uh, election of President Obama and all of the fruits that have come and all of the achievements politically that people have grown into. So I thank God for you, the people of the party, and for those that have come to honor my father today. Tonight, we come together bound by our faith in the mighty God with genuine respect and love for our country and inheriting the legacy of a great party. The Democratic Party, which is the best hope for redirecting our nation on a more humane, just, and peaceful course. This is not a perfect party. We are not a perfect people. Yet we are called to a perfect mission. Our mission to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to house the homeless, to teach the illiterate, to provide jobs for the jobless, and to choose the human race over the nuclear race. We are gathered here this week to nominate a candidate and adopt the platform which will expand, unify, direct, and inspire our party and the nation to fulfill this mission. My constituency is the desperate, the damned, the disinherited, the disrespected, and the despised. They are restless and seek relief. They have voted in record numbers. They have invested the faith, hope, and trust that they have in us. 84 was the most difficult campaign because even my friends didn't believe it was possible. Uh, mayors of Detroit and Philadelphia, people who I worked for a long time, didn't think it was possible. And so we did it anyhow. I'm going to tell people like Maxine, who joined early on, Morel, who joined early on. Uh, my wife, uh, I met her at ANT. She was an internationalist. First met her, she was doing a term paper on India and China. She was 19 years old. And she went to Lebanon first. She went to Cuba first. She went to Russia first. So I thank Jack and all you kids who meant so much to me. You survived hopes and fears. I want to thank my God tonight for President Barack Obama. In 84, when I said uh, a black could be president, it was like laughable. Uh, and President Brock ran in, in one in 08. My heart rejoiced because that was part of my dream. I also argued in the same year, Jonathan, that a woman should be on the ticket. My argument was when you're going to get in India and go to Mary Israel and uh, Miss Thatcher in Britain, walking a woman. We said it so loud and so often, one day put Ferrara on the ticket. Now, I see Kamala Harris was one of my 84 80 campaigns workers who take a complete my dream. Uh, I want to speak a special homage to President Barack Obama because he came to office, we lost 600,000 jobs that month. 
We had net gain jobs every month for eight years, largest economic expansion in American history, really. Likewise, uh, we got the deal, 26 million American health insurance for the first time. It should have been more than that if there had been so much hostility towards his work toward poor people. In um, Paris, the, the Paris Accords, environmental accords, and nuclear accords, were a back to the fold. And of course, I remember Michelle as a kid, her and my daughter, Santita, as classmates at Whitney Young working together. Ms. Robinson, I'm going to pay a special tribute, Jonathan, because when Michelle went to the White House, she took her mother with her. I always think about Moses' mother raising Moses and his sister in the big house. To see Ms. Robinson raise those two daughters in the big house, to me, has is divine in its own right. I want to thank Joe Biden, with whom I've worked for more than 30 years, for having the courage and the insight to choose Kamala Harris. Kamala is eminently qualified. She headed the Department of Justice in California, say what well office she won. And Jonathan, in the real sense, uh, she could have been Attorney General on the Supreme Court. She's on the ticket. She's eminently qualified. And that's a good thing. So Joe Biden, hats off to you, my brother. And I tell you, this fall, I'll, I'll be working every day and night uh, to show your success. Jonathan, likewise, uh, some of we, uh, we got the right vote in 65. Big deal for us, Jonathan. Uh, and the, 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 the convention in 1789, only white male landowners could vote. Uh, out of Selma, blacks, white women could serve on juries, 18 years could vote bilingually. We vote on college campuses. We, we democratize democracy in the real sense in this struggle. We have work to do. Our system is not equipped for it. The post office is not equipped for it. And people should vote like they did in World War I and World War II. They're asking for the $3.5 billion. They're asking for $25 billion for the post office. Well, they're not going to get the $3.5 billion. Therefore, they can't do the universal mail-in vote. It's very simple. How are they going to do it if they don't have the money to do it? Now, they need that money in order to have the post office work so it can take all of these millions and millions of ballots. If we don't make a deal, that means they don't get the money. That means they can't have universal mail-in voting. They just can't have it. If they're not going to approve a bill and the post office, therefore, won't have the money, how can you have those votes? What would mean is the people will have to go to the polls and vote. If they make a deal, the postal service is taken care of, the money they need for the mail-in ballots would be taken care of if we agree to it. That doesn't mean we're going to agree to it. If the Democrats were to give you some of what you want, which you articulated in a series of tweets in the last hour, would you be willing to accept the $25 billion for the Postal Service, including the $3.5 billion to sure, general mail-in they give us what we want. And it's not what I want, it's what the American people want. I met this weekend with the uh, leaders of the Postal Workers Union must be in the picket every post office in America, information picket. Demand that they stop taking out machines, that they don't, don't undercut. It's not just about voting, it's about people getting medicines, about small businesses, about everything that America holds dear. I want to thank, uh, as we fight tonight, we want health care right for all right now. Equal education for all right now. Peace in the world right now. Wear your mask, your distancing, and under protocols right now. Dad, you've come a long way. You've done so much for so long, for so many. I thank you and I thank the persons that are responsible for organizing this to honor you, a tribute that is truly deserving. I saw my great grandmother Matilda, uh, who was not afforded the opportunity for an education, have her first opportunity to vote. You were my first vote for president. Although you did not achieve that dream, you opened the door so that you paved the road you laid the groundwork so that future generations could now thrive and, and not have a ceiling and see no barriers. Uh, thank God for you and all the work that you do. And I'm inspired to see how many people are inspired by your work, your legacy, and may it continue on forever and always. God bless you. I'm going to turn the post office issue. I, got, I think about the, the sabotage of the, of the post office on my constitution. You even adjust to this roguery. You can resent it or you can resist I say every postal worker in America, small towns, hamlets and villages and big cities, 
to begin to picket the post office around our country and information pickets. Uh, and other unions must join us. Black Lives Matter must join us. Civil rights must we, we shall fight. Well, we, we basically fight, gentlemen. We, we fight. Thank you, John, for your service, buddy. Love you, Dad, for all that you do. And when we were at our worst, you were at your best. Young America, hold your head high now. We can win. You must never stop dreaming. Face reality, yes. But don't stop with the way things are. Dream of things as they ought to be. Dream. Face pain. But love, hope, faith, and dreams will help you rise above the pain. Use hope and imagination as weapons of survival and progress. But you keep on dreaming, young America. Dream of peace. Peace is rational and reasonable. War is irrational in this age and unwinnable. Dream of teachers who teach for life and not for living. Dream of doctors who are concerned more about public health than private wealth. Dream of lawyers more concerned about justice than the judgeship. Dream of preachers who are concerned more about prophecy than profiteering. Dream on the high road of sound values. You must never surrender to inequality. Women cannot compromise ERA or comparable work. Women are making 60 cents on the dollar to what a man makes. Women cannot buy meat cheaper. Women cannot buy bread cheaper. Women cannot buy milk cheaper. Women deserve to get paid for the work that you do. It's right and it's fair. I'm often asked, Jesse, why do you take on these tough issues? They're not very political. We can't win that way. If an issue is morally right, it will eventually be political. It may be political and never be right. Fannie Lou Hamer didn't have the most votes in Atlantic City. Well, the principles have outlasted every delegate who voted to lock her out. Rosa Parks did not have the most votes, but she was morally right. Dr. King didn't have the most votes about the Vietnam War, but he was morally right. If we are principled first, our politics will fall in place. When you see Jesse Jackson, when my name goes in nomination, your name goes in nomination. I was born in the slum, but the slum was not born in me. And it wasn't born in you, and you can make it. Wherever you are tonight, you can make it. Hold your head high. Stick your chest out. You can make it. It gets dark sometimes, but the morning comes. Don't you surrender. Suffering breeds character. Character breeds faith. In the end, faith will not the support. You must not surrender. You may or may not get there, but just know that you are qualified and you hold on and hold out. We must never surrender. America will get better and better. Keep hope alive. Keep hope alive. Keep hope alive. On tomorrow night and beyond. Keep hope alive. I love you very much. Good morning. We are in the midst of a major drive to get more members, more people engaged and involved in Rainbow Push, uh, supporting the programs of Push for Excellence and the Citizenship Education Fund. If you're interested in public policy and you want to help change the policies that impact those incarcerated, change the policies that impact uh, students attending uh, colleges and universities, if you want to be a policymaker, then you need to join Rainbow Push and join by paying your $35 right now. Some of you watch us every week. You, you listen to us on the radio. You're viewing us on social media. We need you to become a member. It's only $35 a year. If you believe in the scholarships that we give to thousands of students each and every year, we've awarded more than $10 million to scholars year to date. What do you have to do to give and support PUSH? It's really very simple. You can go to rainbowpush.org if you're on a computer and press donate. 
give any amount. Every dollar is important. If you want to talk to somebody, call us at 773-256-2775. You can give right now any denomination that you uh, choose. You can text the word PUSH, P-U-S-H, to 41444. Text the word on your cell phone. Most of you have a cell phone. Just text PUSH, P-U-S-H, to 41444, and you can give any amount that you feel comfortable giving. Or call us, 773-256-2775, or go to rainbowpush.org and just press donate. Wherever you are, you can support us as we keep pushing for you. Watching Kamala Harris make history last week beside Joe Biden led Milwaukee grandmother Denise Calloway to take her own big first step, volunteering for a campaign for the first time ever. That pig really put something on your heart. Oh my gosh, in a way I didn't really expect. I mean, if I'm being honest, when I saw her walk out with him, I, I teared up, I, I cried. Hmm. Um, it is a moment in history that I don't know that I expected to see. It's African-American voters like Callaway who've helped Democrats win Wisconsin year after presidential year, from 1988 until Donald Trump won the state by less than one percentage point in 2016. Black turnout in Milwaukee County that year shrank 19 percent. Small business owner Terrence Collins voted for Barack Obama twice, then stayed home in 2016. To me, it was like picking a... <laughs> oh, uh, evil against evil. <laughs> it was kind of like, so it was like, uh, I'm going to kind of sit this one out because I really didn't like neither one. Mm -hmm. But now, looking back, I wish I would have <laughs> voted for Hillary. 27-year-old Tempest Booker has never cast a ballot for president. Are you more engaged this time? Are you paying? Are you Absolutely. I am. I feel like my vote counts because um, the police brutality with our black men, something needs to be done because I have boys. The fight for equality and against police violence came up again and again in our conversations with voters here. Everybody's woke now. Everybody gets to see what we've endured or we've been going through for so many years. And being part of the solution is getting out and voicing your opinion and getting your vote out there. Terrell Martin has been a Democratic activist since the 1980s. How does Joe Biden take that energy and use it to help get elected? We have all those issues in the city of Milwaukee, unemployment. So he has to address those issues that the young people are looking for in order to be elected. Callaway told me that the Harris pick is evidence Biden is listening and will address those issues, and she intends to help him get the chance. It's very important that as African-American women, we mobilize, because there's one thing that African-American women have learned about when someone is the first, and that is that we all need to rally around that person who's the first so we can make sure there's a second and a third. our votes. I believe it's T.I. in a very enriching commercial who says our vote is our mic. I love that metaphor because a mic amplifies your voice so that you can be heard. T.I. is saying that our vote is our mic. And with that being the case, the sad reality is even though our vote is our mic, we have a Republican Party in this country that is determined determined to mute our mic. This past Monday, I was on a Zoom call with Reverend Jesse Jackson that was being led by his wonderful granddaughter. It was Reverend Jackson's turn to speak. And all of a sudden, as Reverend Jackson was ready to speak, he discovered that his mic was muted. How frustrating was that? Reverend Jackson had something powerful and prophetic to share, a contribution to make, but he could not make the contribution because his mic was muted. Is that not a powerful metaphor for what's going on as Republicans in the name of power over patriotism are determined, here it is, to mute our mic as they suppress the vote. With surgical precision, they are muting our mic. Watch them on the one hand lift up eulogistically the name of John Lewis, but then hypocritically, 
they don't stand for the John Lewis Voting Rights Act because they are determined to mute our mic. They want to mute our mic by playing games with voter registration, playing games as they as they draw funny lines called gerrymandering. They are playing games and as a consequence, they are determined to mute our mic. They want to mute our mic and as they mute our mic, they get in bed politically with outsiders of this country such as Russia that are determined to hack this election and when you look at the illicit relationship between voter suppression and the muting of our mic and they're opening the doors for Russia to hack this election we are witnessing because of Republicans the dismantling of our democracy they are determined to mute our mic. Understand as they mute the mic that they are missing out on the contribution when they tried to mute our mic. Reverend Jackson had something to say, a contribution to make. We were missing out as being the beneficiaries of his prophetic brilliance because his mic was muted. How much is this nation missing out because you were determined Republican Party to mute the mic, but don't think that's the end of the story because Reverend Jackson with undiscourageable determination pressured or pushed on through. And you know what happened? He was able to unmute his mic. He refused to quit until his mic was unmuted. There's the metaphor for us Democrats. And that is we have to have that Jesse Jackson prophetic determination and make up our minds that we are going to push on through until our mics are unmuted. What does that look like? Push on through until we pass boldly the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Push on through until we have automatic voter registration. Push on through until voting day, uh, until election day is a paid holiday. Why? Because Reverend Jackson wants us to think big. I heard Reverend Jackson say, I'm anxious that we see ourselves bigger than we see ourselves. Why? Because in many instances, we have a grasshopper mentality when God wants us to see ourselves as giants capable of pursuing and claiming the promised land. What am I saying? I'm suggesting with Reverend Jackson, now is the time to be courageous, confident, and compassionate. Now is the time to be bold in our policies. Democrats, this ain't no time to be mealy mouth. This ain't no time to lose your spine. Use your spine for your backbone. Stand up straight and boldly move forward with policies that will transform this country. This is the age of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor in their name. We need bold policies that will transform our policing system so that we reimagine public safety. We have to have bold policies that insist that health care is not just a privilege for the few at the top, but it is a right for all of God's children. We need to have bold policies, bold policies that determine that we are going to put an end to environmental racism, is which is right there on the front lines of climate change, which has our planet in. I see you. We need some Democrats with a backbone who will have the courage and the compassion to recognize the wisdom of Jesus because Jesus said a nation will be judged by how it treats the least of these. And right now, I remix Jesus because Jesus would look at this country and Jesus would say, I was hungry and you cut aid to dependent children and you would not give me a living wage. I was thirsty and you contaminated water in Flint, Michigan and other impoverished communities around this nation. I was sick, but I did not have access 
rest of affordable health care and COVID-19 took me out. I was in prison because of mass incarceration and a criminal justice system that was criminal and downright unjust. I was a stranger and you had the nerve to build a wall while at the same time you have in the harbor there in New York a Statue of Liberty saying, give me your tired, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Jesus will say, America, if you don't get your act together, you can, you may well go to hell. Why? Because in as much as you do it to the least of these, my sisters and brothers, you are also doing it unto me. We need to unmute the mic and remember Jesus. I love it because Jesus during the march on Jerusalem, y'all may call it the Palm Sunday processional and Jesus is making his way into Jerusalem and the crowds are crying out. Hosanna. And when they cry out Hosanna, I love it. There are those conservatives who say Jesus tell them to chill out, tell them to be quiet. But y'all know what happened. Jesus said, no, I don't want them to be muted. I want to unmute their mics because if these hold their peace, the rocks are going to cry out. Jesus unmuted their mics and they cried out Hosanna, save us, liberate us from Roman occupation and oppression. Save us, liberate us from economic exploitation and political repression. Jesus unmuted their mics. And when your mic is unmuted, you know what can happen. I guess I'll give it to you like this. I'm done. When you unmute our mics and we go ahead and vote, look what can happen with our votes. Justice can roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. When our mics are unmuted, watch us vote in politicians who are not just about power, but about representation and the quality of their service. Watch us when our mics are unmuted and we vote because with our votes, we will elect politicians who do justice, love mercy and walk humbly with our God. Watch us with our votes. Rock the mic. That's what I've been trying to say. We about to rock that mic. And when we rock that mic, that means we will have the next president of the United States, Joseph Biden, the next vice president of the United States, the amazing Kamala Harris. But we've got to rock the mic. And when we rock the mic, I promise you, America will truly become one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We are here to rock Rock the mic because our vote is our hope that is going to be used as our rope to get out of the hole. Here it is, the hole of the unraveling of democracy that we are experiencing under COVID-45, who has been disastrous in his presiding over COVID-19. But the good news is because we are rocking the mic, we have a, here it is, we have an end to this pandemic. A vaccine for COVID-45 is to rock the mic. And when we rock the mic, America will become America for all of us. When we rock the mic, America will become a true nation of greatness whose greatness is not behind her, but in front of her because we are determined to rock the mic. And guess what? I'm so determined to rock the mic. Mike for Joseph Biden for Kamala Harris that I will fight to rock the mic and when I fight to rock the mic I know we're going to win Jesse Jackson put it like this we never lost a battle where we did not fight but we never won a battle when we did not fight and so we've got to fight to win the battle and since Jesse did not quite get you I gotta go with my boy Kendrick Lamar Kendrick Lamar throws 
down by saying, all my life I had to fight, but if God's got us, we then going to be all right. We going to be all right in the United States of America because mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. We going to be all right because we shall overcome. We going to be all right because Dr. King put it like this, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. We going to be all right because truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne, yet that scaffold sways the future behind the dim unknown. Stands God within the shadows keeping watch above his own. We going to be all right because God is on our side and since God is on our side, all's my life I had to fight. But if God's got us, we then going to be all right because our vote is our mic and I'm determined to rock my mic. Peace. They used to say we were just three-fifths of a man and we had to fight to be fully recognized. Back then, being counted meant marches, pickets, jail cells, and worse. One way you can show we count in less than 10 minutes is to take the 2020 census. Be a warrior for your community. Be counted and make certain adequate funds and political representation are allocated to your state and your neighborhood. Just select one of these easy options. By phone, call 844-330-2020, online at mycensus2020.gov, or simply mail in your survey. Never forget, you are somebody. Don't delay. Take the census today. Dr. King, I went to jail with uh, seven students July 17th, 1960, almost 60 years ago. We never stopped moving. I lost a few jail cells and death. We never stopped moving. I thought it was time to write some of it down so the only human generation can learn how we did, what we did, and how global it was. We were speaking about Mandela in South Africa, uh, India, Qatar, right, Gandhi in India, here, uh, here at home. This book tells the story, so please get it and give it to your friends. Read it, let's, let's argue about it, let's discuss it. Yep, so the book is Keeping Hope Alive, Sermons and Speeches of Reverend Jesse Jackson um, Sr. It's, it's quite a good collection. You know, we've got sermons and speeches from around the globe because you have made such a global impact, not just here in the U.S., but around the world. Thank you for tuning in to our International Saturday Morning Broadcast. We need your support. Here are ways to give to Rainbow Push Coalition. Text PUSH, P-U-S-H, to 41444 to support the work of Reverend Jesse Jackson Sr. and Rainbow Push Coalition. When you shop, Amazon gives. Visit Amazon Smile and select PUSH for excellence as your charitable organization by starting your shopping at Smile. Dot Amazon dot com. Get involved with the movement. I am somebody. I may be poor, but I am somebody. Join the movement. If you're not a member, become a member. I am somebody. Fighting the most important battles freedom and justice for all. You made us change. Oh, to bring closer. Join Rainbow Push. But you're not pushing me away. Join